This is ISC 460 at the University of Southern California. We will be discussing the topic of time value of money. Hello everyone. Uh, today we are going to talk about the time value of money part two, which is same as last topic. Last week topic, but we are going to deal with uh, different contents and concepts. So first, I want to introduce my colleague, uh, and this is Pierre Cho, and Andrei Kovac, and Stephanie Acevas, and me. And the content we are going to talk about is this and first nominal versus effective interest rate will be discussed by Peter. And Stephanie will talk about continuous compounding and gradient series will be talked about by me about the arithmetic and Andrea will talk about geometric gradient series and he will also uh, recap all the topics and there is one of the and Peter is good. Alright, so for the first topic, nominal versus uh, effective interest rates, first we have to define a few terms. Um, first one is what a period is, which is a um, just any um, specific period of time, like a um, set amount of time. Uh, we can say a week, a month, a year could be one period. Um, those can be broken up into sub-periods for a week. Each day would be a sub-period of the week. Um, the weeks would be a sub-period of the month and so on. Um, and the equations we come up with are reused. Periods will be deno denoted with the capital N and subperiods with the capital M. So the nominal rate is given as R equals M times I sub M. I sub M is the effective interest rate per subperiod. Um, the effective rate is given with I equals the quantity 1 plus I sub M all raised to the N power minus 1, which can be rewritten using the, the equation for nominal rate to below. And so I'm going to give an example that I came up with um, to try and show the difference between what nominal versus effective interest rate can get you. Um, OK, so um, imagine a few years from now you're married and you have a child. And then uh, your child grows up to be a young Asian kid named Peter. And um, he, throughout his life, has shown that he is gifted intellectually, and he is accepted into Mensa International, which is the Society for High IQ Individuals. Um, so your alma mater, USC, finds out about this and wants your child to come to the university. So they offer to give you a grant package that they will hold so that it gains interest. Um, they give you three options. Option A is $25,000 with a nominal interest rate of 11% and 12 subperiods. So annually, it's compounded month monthly. Um, option B, $27,000 with 11%, but no subperiods. Basically, it's compounded annually. Uh, option C, $30,000 with a 9% interest rate, compounded monthly. Um, so just based on these numbers, does anyone have like a s preference to submit right now? If someone wants to shout one out. Option A. Option A. You think that's the best? Okay. So um, calculated the effective interest rates, and pretty much for option B, nominal is the effective because M equals N. Um, these are the effective rates for A and C. Uh, if you plug in to the equation, you'll get all the future values. And you'll see that option A is the best option by a small margin over option B. And option C, even though it has the greatest present value, is actually the worst option. But then, 
going, if your child is that smart, they'll probably have his pick of colleges to get a full ride. So on to the next topic. Um, Stephanie. All right, so Peter talked about what effective interest rate is versus nominal, but effective is really dependent on the number of subperiods you decide to, to divide into. So as he mentioned, we can do it annually, once a year, monthly, weekly, but what happened if the number of subperiods was approaching infinity? So what would happen if um, we were compounding instantaneously, meaning the second that you finish compounding, you compound again. So this right here is our original equation for calculating future value, given the present value. If we're taking the limit as n is approaching infinity, we're going to get this equation. And it has a lot to do with the actual numerical value of e. So the derivation, it's a little complicated, but it has to do with the actual value of e. As we approach infinity, though, we're going to get that the future value is equal to the principal amount times e raised to uh, the effective rate versus the number of periods. And so as we can see, as n is increasing, so does the effective rate. Um, the number of periods, because you have more opportunities to compound interest, you um, are going to end up with a larger amount, a larger final amount. All right, so up here we're going to have a graphical representation, but to start off, Continuous, this is our equation. We have a scenario where we're given $10,000 at 6% interest. Um, and continuous just means that n is approaching infinity. But discrete is that we're assuming that there is a, a set number of uh, periods. So as we can see, the continuous function is approaching infinity a bit quicker. Now this graph only illustrates from n equal to um, bit n equal to 50 periods, so it's not that close to infinity, but we can always or already see the difference between the two. All right, so we're going to do a quick example. We're going to be on the board. All right, so most of the problems for com continuous compounding are kind of straightforward. The most confusing it's going to get is the way that they word the problem and trying to figure out what information that you're given. But we're going to start off with this one. So we're given, you have an interest rate of 8%. And um, your period N is equal to 10 years. And your initial principal is 3 million. And so we want to find the future amount after this period of 10 years. So for this equation or for this example, it's essentially just plugging into the equation. So you get final is equal to principal. what would have happened had we not been compounding continuously. Let's say we're compounding just once a year annually. So we're going to use the first equation. And then can somebody plug that one in? difference. This is only after 10 years, and this is already a big amount of money, but as you have a larger principal and as you have more uh, periods to compound over more time, the difference is going to be more obvious.
Okay, so let's talk about gradient theory to the arithmetic gradient. Uh, arithmetic gradient, we, we can define uh, uh, our cash flow is increased or decreased by a uniform amount from period to period. And this is the constant amount of increasing or decreasing. And it is called gradient. And uh, also it always always starts with zero gradient like you see here. And from this graph, you can see the increasing slope and that means there is a constant value of gradient and uh, we, we also are uh, uh, oh, and that that's the positive positive constant gradient and we can also call uniform gradient and this is talking about and, and this graph is is a newly and uh, gradient so red line is annuity uh, and blue line is gradient. So you can see the relation between annuity and gradient from this graph. And there is two equations. One is gradient present word factor, and this is to find present value P and This is gradient uniform field factor, and this is to find any value by given gradient. And then this is example. A lower class paid 1,000 at the end of the first year, and 2,000 at the second, and 3,000 at the third, and so on for 10 years. So there is 1,000. Uh, Thousand gradient at the end of the year. So, and if there is only one price in the world, 10,000 tickets are sold, then you can invest your money at a square and 50 percent. So, how much is the ticket worth the network? So, we can see gradient thousand and the interest 15 percent and 20 period. And we need to find A first, N, which is A, N, E, and we can put the, this into the gradient theory work factor, and then we get 6,300. And so that we find P, which is A, and we get 39,841.17. And we are finding the value of the one ticket with the present value. So we, we divide P over 10,000, so we get 4,000. And for the next example, find the present equivalent of the following cash flow by weight by 80%. So, so the graph has peak at the period 5. So before the five, there's increasing slope with positive gradient, and after five, there is uh, uh, the negative slope with um, the increased slope with negative gradient. Yeah, so and we find P one from this and P2, P3, and P add P1, P2, and P3, and we get this. Uh, so I'm going to talk about uh, geometric gradients. Uh, as per the book, uh, the definition of a geometric gradient is, uh, describes a condition in which cash flow growth is increasing or decreasing at a constant uh, rate instead of a uniform amount. 
Um, like I said, different from uh, arithmetic gradients, since a geometric gradient represents uh, increasing, decreasing growth, whereas ar arithmetic gradient represents a uniform level of growth uh, or decay. Uh, this increasing growth, uh, which uh, is conventionally um, expressed as a rate uh, or a percentage, uh, the percentage is usually expressed as little g, which we see in our textbooks, uh, as opposed to big g, which denotes uh, arithmetic gradient. Uh, we can describe a geometric gradient series um, with uh, uh, using a graph. Uh, so what's going on graphically, uh, we have, let's say we have n periods, and uh, we have our first annuity at the first period. Uh, we have A1, and then from the next period, if the growth increases at some rate g, then we're going to have A1 plus A1 times the, the percentage that it grew by from the previous amount. And we can extrapolate this further uh, uh, for n periods. Yeah. Uh, this, sorry, this is a, a, a graph of uh, decay. And it, it, mathematically, it's very similar. And so from this graph, uh, we can uh, get the present amount of the series of annuities. And uh, this is the equation given in the book. Uh, we haven't shown the derivation just for time purposes. Uh, so we'll just give you the equations. Uh, this is for if the interest rate is equal to the growth rate, and likewise if the interest rate is uh, is equal. I'm sorry, this is not equal. If if the interest rate is equal to the growth rate, you get this equation right here, and that can be shown just taking the limit of that equation. So uh, we have an example uh, putting away for travel expenses. Uh, an airplane ticket price will increase nine percent in each of the next five years. Uh, the cost at the end of the first year will be $210. How much should be put away now to cover a student's travel home at the end of each year for the next five years? Uh, assume an interest rate of 5%. So if we, if we depict a cash flow diagram to illuminate the problem a little bit further, uh, we have, we're looking for the uh, present amount. We're given uh, an initial annuity of 210 over the course of uh, five years. Like I said, given we have a growth rate of 9%, uh, an annuity of 210, initial annuity, uh, interest rate 5%, and uh, number of periods is equal to five. Uh, we go ahead and use that present uh, value equation um, with uh, geometric gradient series, and we end up with this number. So that's how much they should put away now in order to uh, afford the ticket. Uh, so we can also use uh, the present value uh, of a geometric gradient series in order to find the future value. And we know that we have this equation uh, available to us. And all we have to do from there is plug in the present value equation into this equation. And then we finally get, uh, after rearranging uh, uh, the terms a little bit, you get this equation. Uh, we have an example illustrating uh, how we can use uh, future worth in a problem. Uh, graduating chemical engineer is going to make $68,000 a year with Pfizer. Uh, a total of 12% of the chemical engineer's salary will be placed in the mutual fund of their choice. The chemical engineer can count on a 4% salary increase with the standard of living increases for the next 35 years of employment. If the chemical engineer is aggressive and places their retirement in the stock index fund on average 11% over the course of their career, what can the chemical engineer expect at retirement? So again, a uh, cash flow diagram, we want the future amount. Uh, we have the initial annuity and we have the number of periods. Like I said, given amounts, uh, we know that at the first year they're going to make 68000 and 12% of that is going to be put into a, a mutual index fund. Uh, we have the growth rate, interest rate, number of periods. Uh, we're trying to find F, and we can plug her into the equation, and we get just over $4 million. Uh, just to recap, we covered uh, nominal versus effective interest rates. Uh, then Stephanie went over continuous compounding, and uh, Yosef and myself went over arithmetic and geometric gradient series. And that's going to wrap up our presentation. Does anyone have any questions? Uh, he 